but Mr. Jeff Riley is a renowned cardiovascular educator, expert clinician, perfusionist, consultant, and editor. He's managed clinical teams and directed perfusion technology education programs at several major academic healthcare centers and in the private sector. Jeff is an award-winning author in more than 300, oh no, I'm sorry, 100 peer-reviewed publications focusing on quality management, perfusion education, simulation, and original research topics in perfusion and extracorporeal technology. Jeff served the American, uh, the AMSEC Society as a president from 2014 to 16, and in 2012 was uh, named one of 36 pioneers in perfusion at AMSEC's 50th anniversary international conference. That was recently. Currently, Jeff is a research associate professor at SUNY, uh, upstate New York and a science officer for biomedical simulations. Importantly, he serves on the International Board of Blood Management, which offers the Adult ECMO Specialist Certification Exam, known as the CESA Exam for Adult ECMO. Jeff was one of my former clinical education educators back several decades ago at Emory. I have been fortunate to work with him on several projects over the years. I remember sitting at an ELSO meeting with him while I was a perfusion liaison on the ELSO board and looking for corroboration with developing a standardized testing for ECMO clinicians. Well, in that meeting, if Jeff remembers, we were kind of bounced out of that meeting with that coming up with that idea and trying to cooperate. But he and the persistence of other AMSEC leaders maintained the course and developed the CESA exam, which has now become the only valid certification exam for adult ECMO. Even the grandfather of ECMO, Dr. Robert Bartlett, has taken and passed, I might add, the exam. So we have asked Jeff for an update on his presentation entitled First Year Experience with the Adult ECMO Specialist Certification Exam. Welcome, Jeff. And I might add that right after Jeff's talk, we will have a panel discussion with many of the presenters from this morning's session. So take it away, Jeffrey. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, good. Let's see, uh, 1979, Bill, or 1980 at Emory? When is, or was it 81? Somewhere in there. And of course, me was uh, 1983 with me. 83, yeah. Yeah, sir. Ty was 1979 or 78 or 77 or somewhere. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. What a great opportunity uh, and what a privilege to follow Dr. LaRusso. Um, and it's a, a pleasure to update you on on the actually the first 10 months experience uh, uh, of the exam, we're right now the we're registering uh, candidates for the exam until April 30th, and then the exam will be offered uh, online May 1 through the 5th. Um, I'm representing AMSEC in the International Board of Blood Management. Um, here are my other disclosures. I work on AMSEC University also, and I'm an employee of Biomed Simulation Inc. And I'm with Dr. Larusso. Um, ECMO is not simple, especially when we try and simulate it. Um, uh, and tomorrow afternoon, just a short plug, uh, we actually have a demonstration of a hybrid ECMO model uh, with a simulator. So it uh, should be fun to follow up Dr. LaRusso's uh, presentation. I also want to acknowledge um, the board members on the international board, uh, Mark Lucas, uh, Keith Samalek, uh, James Riggers, uh, uh, the president of AMSEC and sits on the board uh, uh, ad hoc. And we also have a new board member, Jeff Excel from uh, South Carolina, just joined us. Um, and for this first exam, uh, the adult exam, we had 17 uh, subject matter experts who helped us develop the exam uh, to contribute to the validity of the exam. You'll see uh, William Harris is there uh, on that list. Um, and I'm going to talk about Susan's contribution here in a, in a minute or so. Um, we use a test platform called the Easy LMS. Um, and uh, when you take the exam, you, you are given access to uh, one version of the exam uh, with your email and, your, and a password. And you've uh, qualified a preceptor who's watching you take the exam. 
we used a model that uh, actually we got it from the real estate uh, folks. Um, and they um, uh, use that uh, distance testing model uh, with great success. And, and uh, we've been doing other exams this way for several years and we haven't had an example of, of leakage of content or, or uh, uh, people trying to game the system. Uh, I'm sure you read the goals already. I wanted to talk about the exam, uh, some of the results of the exam. Uh, we have three exams right now, the patient blood management exam uh, for technologists, the auto transfusion exam. We have a patient blood management specialist uh, for nurses and perfusionists and others, and then the adult ECMO specialist certification exam. We offered it uh, the first time uh, back in February of uh, 2020 uh, to the public. Um, We've written about, uh, back in 2018, we wrote about uh, what was new in education. And the buzzword in education is micro-credentials, micro-credentials, uh, which are little credentials, of course. Um, universities are, are taking two years of a, of a graduate degree, carving out three courses and giving a mini certificate uh, for completing those three courses. Uh, there is actually activity in two universities uh, to make micro credentials for ECMO specialists. And they go to school at that university at distance for two semesters, take three or four courses and come out with a, uh, a credential uh, for ECMO specialists. Um, so we're looking forward to, to seeing that happen. Um, we wrote about uh, what we were doing at SUNY. Um, and then also uh, we talked about AMSEX motivation uh, to use badges and micro-credentials uh, to help improve the safety and quality of, of ECMO in the, in the United States. We have several precedents in perfusion. I'm sure you all recognize uh, the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion uh, manages the CCP exam. The International Board of Clinical Technologies was around in early days and did the CCT. Uh, we have our International Board of Blood Management. And then I'm gonna talk about this other group, American Nurses Credentialing Center. They're the group that manage the magnet recognition program. And as part of that, they recognize uh, training programs and exams that can contribute to uh, the magnet program. And certainly we have several state licensure board exams that our RT friends and RNs and, and CCPs all know about but we're not here to talk about licensure board exams. We're here to talk about voluntary certification, voluntary credentialing exams, um, which are not governed by state law, but they may be uh, requested by your employer uh, for you to volunteer to take the exams uh, and to uh, be successful on the exam. Um, there's a lot of guidance for writing these national certification exams, voluntary exams. Um, the American Psychological uh, Society has been very uh, uh, outspoken on the topic. As a matter of fact, they put together a book. Let's see if I can get it in focus here. Uh, hello, I'm teasing you, but it's a big green book and they call it Standards for Educational and Psychological Testing. I'm sorry, it's not coming through. Um, they worked with the American Educational Research Association and the National Council. Here's that credentialing center. And even the American Disability Act uh, have, have uh, guidance for how these exams are to, that uh, are being given uh, should be fair and equitable to folks with disabilities. And again, um, we learn from the state licensure board exams, but, but our guidance, uh, uh, comes mainly from the American Psychological Society. There's also a national organization for boards giving exams. And um, that's exciting. We could become a member of the board of boards uh, that give these exams. And we've certainly considered that uh, at the IBBM. Uh, the standards that the uh, APA offer uh, fall into nine different buckets. Um, 
And the first bucket, the first standard is about uh, test validity. And there's 25 substandards, or that's a bad word. Uh, there's 25 standards underneath the, this main standard um, of setting forth uh, uh, the validity of the exam. I'm not gonna read each of these to you, but I am gonna use this as a, a quick outline for uh, talking about how we've developed um, uh, the certified ECMO specialist uh, exam. Um, the first uh, APA standard is about validity. There's several different types of validity. As I know, you know, uh, content, face validity, construct, uh, criterion. Um, the APA uh, and other organizations uh, are quick to make sure that uh, test developers state clearly and share how test scores are to be interpreted, how they're to be used. Of course, people taking the exam are the primary customer, but another customer for these exams are ECMO coordinators, ECMO managers, ECMO medical directors, hospitals that may hire uh, ECMO specialists, um, contract uh, service groups uh, providing uh, manpower and for monitoring ECMOs. They all become um, customers for this. And, and it's important that the boards that offer these exams up uh, are very transparent uh, and give the test, uh, uh, test consumers uh, information they need to, to again, go to its validity and to its uh, reliability of the test. Uh, standard two is about precision, reliability, accuracy. Um, and again, test takers or test providers should provide to test takers and, and people in, who are using these scores uh, information about reliability. Um, we have uh, 247 people who have completed the exam so far, and the candid, candidate reliability is 0.83. Um, the test items, which there are 100 items that we've given to 247 people, uh, reliability is 0.97. Anything over 0.8 is a, an acceptable score. And this reliability tells us about the consistency uh, the internal accuracy of the test questions down here at 0.97 and the people who are signing up for the test, 0.83. It's really interesting. This is the pass rate of the exam. Um, I scratch my head and wonder how they came out to be the same number, uh, but it comes down to uh, internal between candidate performance on the exam. And the fact that uh, 240 ECMO specialists who declare themselves ECMO specialists uh, can perform at this consistency is a good, and we're really pleased with our test questions uh, performing at this uh, reliability number. Um, when uh, fairness is uh, another standard, um, again, lots of sub statements to that standard. Um, in order for an exam to be fair, the board needs to share with the uh, uh, share with the world that. Uh, um, how the validation development administration scoring uh, are, have all been done and what we do to minimize the variance amongst test, test takers and between test questions. As soon as you hit submit and submit your answers as a, a test taker for this exam, um, in your email comes back your score. Uh, and it looks just like this. And there are sections to the exam uh, that were built by the the uh, board and the subject matter experts. Um, and for example, there's a terminology section and 19 of the 100 questions deal with terminology. And this particular person, uh, this particular person scored, um, four, got 14 of those 19 questions correct. Uh, there were five questions that dealt with anatomy and so on. And we get down here, safety and failure modes. There were 49 of the, of the 100 questions that either the STEM or the right answer or the distractors uh, called on knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, in safety and failure modes. Uh, initiation and weaning, there were 12 questions that were uh, very much directed at the initiation and weaning. Um, and this particular person, um, although they scored 80, they got 100% on this section. Um, 
and of course we review the results to make sure that uh, uh, everything was okay and um, uh, and they get another written re report in the mail with their certificate at a later date. Um, but we've been pleased with the immediate reinforcement uh, that we've asked uh, uh, that that people have asked for, uh, our candidates have asked for. Um, another part of this fairness is looking at each test item, and we have the ability. We use software that that's called Rash R A S C H. Uh, it's Win Steps. Uh, is the name of the software actually, and it uses Rosh analysis uh, to look at items. And we have all our items listed here, and we have how many people have taken those items, and this is how many people have gotten it correct. Uh, so the percent correct is a measurement of difficulty of a test question. And of course, the lower the percentage, the more difficult. I've covered up the names of the test stems here so that I wouldn't give too much away. Um, but we look at each of these, uh, these measures uh, uh, every time people take the test and we'll look at the, an item as a board and say, you know, this item is, people are missing it. Why are they missing it? We've even sent uh, uh, three items out to the subject matter experts afterwards uh, and to get them to take those three items again uh, and give us feedback on, on uh, uh, is the question accurate? What's the right answer? What's the correct key? Uh, what do you think about the wording? Does it belong on the test? Is it information that's used frequently during the test? We have a, a routine we go through with the subject matter experts uh, uh, to help us understand that, that information. Um, test design and scores. Uh, we published the test uh, matrix, the test design. Uh, you can see the, here are these uh, these categories coming up again, uh, and we have four major sections. And as you go up in the matrix and to the right, uh, the difficulty increases. Um, and there are 27 out of the 100 questions that deal with team communication. 45 out of the 100 uh, relate back to policies and procedures, uh, and so on. Terminology, 22 out of 100 of the questions. Uh, we fit each question into four of these cells or four of these boxes. And that certainly helps people understand where the, the test is coming from. And you can see there is more test questions relating to the practice um, of, of monitoring ECMO patients. Um, uh, and certainly it goes back to the job description that we've um, that we studied and the subject matter experts have approved for an ECMO specialist uh, monitoring a patient attached to an ECMO device uh, uh, and on ECMO. Um, so here's another breakdown of the, the categories. <clears throat> and this is the maximum number of questions related to that category. And it's also the maximum score that those 247 people hit and the minimum score. Uh, the mean, here's the percent of those questions in each, each section, the standard deviation, the median, and the interquartile range. 50% uh, of the responses are within three um, points or three questions out of this, around this median of 15 out of a total of 18. Um, and if you look, the, the two hardest sections, two hardest categories are pharmacology uh, and lab analysis. And some of the feedback that we've gotten um, is that ECMO specialists don't always deal with lab analysis and point of care testing. And ECMO specialists don't always deal with the pharmacologic aspects. Um, so uh, just because our subject matter experts and the board wrote a job description doesn't mean everybody fits into that job description, but our candidate reliability of 0.83 is telling us that we're connecting with the right people um, uh, who are, are in that job description and where the construct of our exam and the context of our exam is consistent with the job description. We depend very much on our, our website to, um, to present the knowledge, skills, and abilities and the job description. Uh, there's a list of 35 knowledge statements 
uh, over 25 skills and uh, just as many ability statements that describe the job description. So before somebody takes the exam, they certainly can sit down with their supervisor and say, and read these knowledge, skills, and abilities and come to the realization whether it's a good exam for them or not. Um, and whether interpreting their performance on the exam will help them at home uh, in their employment situation if that's why they're motivated to take this exam. <clears throat> Uh, support documentation, another standard. Uh, we have a lot of documentation. We, we have a great certificate and it was a pleasure. Uh, we gave uh, uh, Dr. Bartlett uh, uh, 001. He got the, he earned the first uh, uh, blood management certificate uh, and he was a real sport about taking the exam. Um, and he gave us feedback on it too, which was great and very helpful. Um, we, Test takers have rights. Um, and oftentimes you don't feel that way when you're taking a test, uh, but you do. Um, and basically it's that it's fair and that the test is really testing what it purports to test. Uh, and there, there's some documentation around where the test questions came from and the fact that they are manageable questions. They, are, uh, they can be answered uh, in, a fair, in a fair manner. And part of that is is teaching test takers or helping test takers to prepare for a test. Um, and I didn't appreciate this uh, too much until I started getting into these guidelines. And, and it really is uh, incumbent on the, uh, the test developers to offer up some kind of, of test preparation. And we're gonna do that through AMSEC University. Um, AMSEC University has several ECMO or mechanical uh, circulatory assist um, uh, courses. They're all one hour courses. Uh, most of them have been uh, uh, registered with the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion. So you can earn up to 10 category one CEUs every three year cycle uh, through taking 10 of these courses. And certainly um, uh, we would hope that people registering for the uh, for the CES uh, ECMO specialist exam, non-members of AMSEC uh, will be able to get to the review courses in here um, and they'll be mod modestly priced, uh, $25 um, to take the review course. Um, so uh, we're trying to, to meet that, uh, that standard. Uh, so more about test users' rights. Um, um, again, a lot of the test users uh, will be medical directors of ECMO programs, uh, ECMO managers, ECMO coordinators, uh, whoever is managing the, uh, the ECMO teams, uh, the ECMO specialist teams. Uh, so it's an important that uh, who's, if you're a, an ECMO manager and you're asking your team to take this exam as an indication of, of how well your internal um, ELSO recommended, ELSO guided uh, training is working, uh, then um, it was helpful to know, you know what you can expect in, in outcomes. Um, first 10 months, uh, 247 uh, takers, and this includes the pilot group uh, who took it. 100 uh, test questions, here's our reliability numbers. Um, the mean score is 76 plus or minus 9.8. And it's, it fits a normal distribution statistically. Uh, the median score is 77. Uh, half the scores above and below 77. Um, the average question success rate is 74%. So these questions aren't easy. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, an easy question uh, has a, a, a difficulty of 90%, uh, of 90% 90 of the people uh, get it right. Um, and when we do the Roush um, ranking, uh, it turns it into a logarithmic number and passing is uh, a Roush of 1.0. And that correlates back to a score of 67.5%. So you have to get six, above 67 and a half on the test to pass the test. Um, 
The average pass rate uh, of candidates is 83%, <clears throat> or conversely, 17% fail on the first attempt. Um, this number's wrong. It's 11 countries uh, have been represented, uh, and I apologize for that number being wrong. Uh, so it's it's interesting. Uh, it's um, I guess we could say it's an international test. Uh, and I will say that. The other thing we ask people to do after they've taken the exam and they've gotten back their email report is we send them off to a survey monkey uh, site where we ask them to uh, answer some questions or agree with some, some statements. The first statement, or one of the first statements is overall, how do you rate the ECMO specialist certification exam? Uh, and we go very appropriate, appropriate, not appropriate, not appropriate at all. Um, and we're up here in the 90% on appropriateness. 80% um, of the 247 people have responded to the survey, um, which is pretty good. Uh, we remind people all the time that we need their feedback, um, uh, but we've been pleased with uh, this particular number. Um, Another statement, the certification exam content and questions are consistent with my job description. Um, strongly agreed, agreed, disagree, strongly disagree. Uh, some people have strongly disagreed, uh, a couple of disagrees. Uh, but if we add these together, 64 and 28, 90, I can't add, 80, 89. Um, percent. Don't try and talk and add. It's really funny. I ask my students to do that all the time. But we're, again, happy with, uh, with the level of agreement on, the, on job description uh, agreement. That means, uh, at least for us, that the right people are signing up for this exam and that we wrote a job description and identify the, the knowledge, skills, and abilities in that job description that are consistent with their, with their jobs. On the whole, the certification exam questions were written at the right level of difficulty. Strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. Another statement, will you recommend the exam to your adult ECMO specialist peers? And it's coming in up here at 92, 93%. Um, say yes, they would recommend it. So we depend on this, uh, this feedback um, a lot. Let's see. Um, we talked a little bit about the American Nurses Credentialing uh, Center, uh, the ANCC, uh, and how they manage the magnet recognition program. And they maintain a list of exams and training programs uh, that exist for the sole purpose of, of helping uh, hospitals and groups uh, seek magnet recognition. Um, and it's interesting, uh, when we first started off in the exam, we got feedback from RNs who said, uh, this should be part of the magnet program. Um, evidently in some hospitals, um, nurses who take magnet recognized uh, uh, micro certifications and pass them actually get paid a little bit more per hour uh, for being successful in those exams. <clears throat> and the hospital gets credit for their employees um, uh, mastering those exams. And it's interesting, I, I listed these down through here and you'll see there's consistency between what the ANCC wants to see in, in an application uh, for recognition for your exam uh, compared to what the American Psychological Association. Um, it's there to re reflect a professional body of knowledge and skills, which typically have, have been defined the scope and standards of practice. Um, and we're starting to get that in, in ECMO, uh, as we've seen from our, our presenters today. Uh, the credential is professional rather than technical or just skills-based. And uh, we made the argument that because nurses, uh, respiratory therapists, MDs, CCPs, uh, and others, uh, biomed technicians are taking this exam and working this job description, that it is rather professional compared to a technical 
um, uh, job. Uh, they, they, uh, the ANCC requires a logical job analysis that gets revised every seven years um, to reflect current knowledge and skills required uh, of the profession or specialty. Uh, and we did our job analysis two and a half years ago, two years ago. Um, the development of the test relies on uh, generally accepted development and psychometric uh, principles. And again, the APA is driving us um, and it's time limited. Uh, right now, the recertification for the certification exam is two years. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, it has to be national in scope, not a state or state-based system. Um, it has to be independent of a special class or course. Uh, there can't just be one way to gain these knowledge, skills, and abilities to sit for this exam. And of course, uh, in ECMO, there's uh, uh, 50 different ways to, to learn the KSA, the knowledge, skills, and abilities uh, for ECMO specialists. Um, the assessment administration environment is standardized and follows industry standards. And um, uh, a credential is issued and the credential has to have meaning um, and easy to find out the meaning. And we maintain the meaning of the credential on our website and a list of the um, candidates who have successfully passed the exam. Um, I wanted to, to recognize Susan. Susan, when did uh, you started this argument in at least 10 years ago or 11 years ago when you were president of AMSEC, uh, when you were surveying AMSEC members and, and uh, you started a little bit of a, a ruckus. <coughs> um, there were a lot of perfusionists who wanted to be recognized, a lot of nurses who wanted to be recognized as ECMO specialists, but then there was a, a crew of perfusionists who didn't want non-perfusionists coming into the ECMO world. Um, and of course, uh, you can talk, comment more about that uh, when I finish up. Um, I wanna share one more thing with you. And um, that's a study that we just finished. Um, uh, Al Stammer stood up after our presentation at AMSEC last year and said, this would be a great tool to study educational processes. And I thought, well, I'm gonna go back and do that because uh, Al and I motivate each other in that way. Uh, we just submitted uh, an article the effectiveness of three different curricular models to teach fundamental ECMO specialist skills to entry-level perfusionists. Uh, that's a mouthful, um, but we did this uh, a year ago um, when the exam was first available and uh, uh, when we wanted to uh, look at our graduates uh, coming out of, of um, the SUNY program. <coughs> and then uh, our friends at Vanderbilt got involved too. At SUNY in our master's program, we have capstone projects that uh, they do. And uh, a student uh, earning their master's, of course, we prepare them for the CCP exam from the American board. But we also ask them to pick one of these uh, five capstone areas. One of the capstones is mechanical to circulatory support and ECLIS. Um, and each one of these capstones areas has an exam other than the CCP exam. <laughs> <clears throat> or the promise of an exam uh, coming up. Uh, and we had students who had selected uh, ECMO, ECLIS. Uh, some of our students in the perfusion education program had actually served as ECMO specialists uh, um, in their hospitals. Uh, uh, and it was, it was great to have them uh, come into the program, of course. Um, so we looked at three groups, they were small groups, um, we looked at the post-baccalaureate uh, graduates from Vanderbilt. We looked at five <clears throat> graduates from SUNY. And then we looked at four who had taken the uh, capstone uh, portfolio um, and they had done extra study. They had even sacrificed clinical time running heart lung machines to follow clinicians, uh, perfusionists, preceptors uh, in ECMO services uh, in our clinical rotations. We were a little bit worried about them uh, doing uh, fewer cases as perfusionists and doing more cases uh, or ECMO shifts, <clears throat> but it worked out uh, well and they've met their, their criteria. 
um, to sit for the American boards. Um, so we compared these three groups and their performance on this uh, national certification exam. <clears throat> I know this is really busy, um, but we looked at their total score, their Roush measure, how many items they recognized on the test. And this is uh, pretty popular. We did this with the, with the, uh, sub, with the uh, pilot group. Uh, they, could, they had another sheet of paper as they were taking the test and they wrote down whether they recognized whether the, the content in that question belonged in the exam and was it fair. And they would score that exam question as keep it or lose it. Um, <clears throat> here are our sections again, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this. Here's a distribution of all the people who have taken the exam. Um, this is a Roush Logit uh, measure, which ranks people. And here was the people in the capstone versus people not in the capstone. So we felt pretty good about this and it was statistically significant, uh, pretty exciting. Uh, here's that normal distribution of all these test scores. <coughs> I apologize. Um, normally distributed. Um, and uh, uh, when we looked and drilled down on where the differences were in these three groups of how perfusionists are prepared, we found distance, uh, differences in recognized items. Uh, the ones in the, um, the capstone actually, I'm sorry, the ones in the, from the, um, from the program that didn't have a capstone and didn't have clinical rotations, specifically Tecmo recognized fewer items. Um, again, here's our lab analysis uh, coming back. Uh, uh, it seems like the, the folks in group three did better on the lab analysis and point of care testing uh, section, <coughs> pardon me. And then finally, uh, the scores were higher in the capstone group uh, for safety and failure modes. Uh, when we compared the, the three uh, groups of graduates, perfusion graduates, everybody passed the exam. Um, uh, and it was not statistically significant between the three groups, but they did rank out uh, according to uh, the capstone. Um, the official courses uh, in the course catalog on ECMO and versus uh, the way a lot of postgraduate, post baccalaureate certificate programs uh, teach ECMO with lectures and uh, the clinical experience that is gained uh, from where they're at. So to summarize, um, I wanna thank Susan for starting all this. I wanna thank the AMSEC board in 2018 who turned to the IBBM and said, please write this exam. Uh, the proliferation of ECMO is, is fast and furious. We're concerned about the safety of ECMO patients and we're concerned about um, um, us sharing what we know about ECMO with the rest of uh, uh, the folks, uh, the other professionals doing ECMO. And they asked us to write an exam that, that spoke to safety and to preparation to be a safe, uh, well-prepared or, or minimally prepared at least uh, ECMO specialists uh, monitoring and taking care of circuits and patients on ECMO. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Terrific work, man. Um, <laughs> takes, gonna, it takes a village. Yes. I'm going to let Susan comment uh, on this in a second. As uh, you were right, she was so instrumental as AMSEC president in trying to bring the certification standard uh, to light within the ELSA organization as well as through um, AMSEC membership. I was perfusion liaison at the time, so I was at in between listening to the ELSA leadership and AMSEC leadership and trying to do kumbaya and make friends. And uh, I know that Dr. Payton's online as well. He'll join us in the panel discussion and he's now president of ELSO. Um, but at that time, uh, well, Susan, I'll, I'll let you uh, talk about that in a second. Jeff, one question I have before I let Susan fly with that experience is somebody, a couple of you have asked, if you're a fully qualified perfusionist, 
uh, why should you be taking the CESA exam or the uh, blood bank, uh, blood, uh, the autologous management um, blood cell saver exam? I have my opinions, but I'll let you speak first. Well, I don't speak for the American board. Um, and uh, my flip answer is for sport, uh, just to see if you can do it. It's there. Uh, you know, it has the knowledge, skills, and abilities for the job description. And it's like, if it's there, it's like climbing a, a mountain. Why did you climb the mountain? Because it's there. Um, it's true. If you're a CCP and you're in good standing with the American board, then uh, it's in your job description as a perfusionist to be able to do ECMO. Uh, so there are a lot of perfusionists that believe that uh, CCP is enough to cover that. And I would probably disagree with that for I know what the education in our schools has been with ECMO. And unless you've been going to conferences and reading up on it and getting into the books, it's such a different animal. So I've always said just because you're a perfusionist doesn't mean that you uh, do ECMO properly. That's it's become very sophisticated. And when I took the exam, I was... Hours. I was blown away on some of the questions um, that if I hadn't studied up a little bit more on it or hadn't been involved with ECMO for 30 some years, that I might have failed it. So uh, I wouldn't take it for granted that because you're a CCP, you're going to pass this exam with flying colors. And saying that, is there anywhere else that people should go to prepare for it other than the Red Book, the ECMO Specialist Manual? And I think you were giving a prep course before you mentioned something about that, Jeff. Um, yeah, um, the ELSO guidelines. Um, we draw on the ELSO guidelines uh, a lot because that's what we do in our jobs um, when we're uh, being ECMO specialists. Um, but right now, uh, no, uh, it's all, you know, we the good references we have are on our website, uh, but I would certainly refer people to ELSO's uh, uh, guidelines. On that, same, on that same subject that Bill was talking about, when you're looking at your test scores, Jeff, and you basically, you know, you see an area that possibly a lot of people did not do as well on, are you modifying your educational tools to upgrade that area for the future representatives? I can't say that we've done that yet, but that's exactly what you're supposed to do with that information. Um, <laughs> we certainly uh, share it with the conference planning committee um, or uh, other people doing educational activities uh, and meetings. Um, but, but you would uh, think you would think that would be part of your curriculum. To, you look at it, you say, okay, well, point of care lab testing with a weak area. How do we modify our educational tools to basically get our testees uh, up to par on that program? Yeah, it's it's our job to to hold candidates to a job description and a standard. It's not our job to prepare them for that job. Um, is, is we're not it, in the business of teaching ECMO specialists. We're in the business of testing ECMO specialists. Um, but we certainly can pass that information on to those whose business it is uh, to teach ECMO specialists. Um, but I, I hear you loud and clear. And we just haven't lived this long enough to do what you're, you're suggesting we should do. Uh, I think being at this meeting and just putting up that these are the two weakest, and a little weak's the, a, the strong word, people are still passing, lots of people are passing these sections, but just people knowing that, uh, I think they would have looked at the list anyway and predicted maybe that pharmacology would be tough. Uh, because a lot of ECMO specialists don't touch drugs at all. We got that. We get that feedback all the time that drugs aren't my thing. They don't make me, you know, work with drugs. It's like, yeah, but when they sneak up on your circuit with a syringe, don't you want to know? <clears throat> hey, Jeff, this is Susan here. I just want to congratulate you and AMSECT and the board of directors for fulfilling this um, dream i guess that amsect and their leadership has one, had wanted to do for a long time it's a, been a it's been a um quite a trip going down this and and a lot of leaderships with different um groups 
all came together finally with your leadership and AMSACT. And, and that's very exciting about this. This I think this is one of my, on my strategic plan back in 2011. So it's been quite a few years, about 10 years now, mm-hmm. or yeah, nine or 10 years. So thank you so very much. And Bill was very instrumental in that also. So thank you all. And thank you for your leadership and guiding us to this. So I think people are just so hungry and starved for education for ECMO and ECMO patients. And um, because, it, you know, we had it in school, but a lot of it, you know, was different and for, we forgot. And I think just a certification, like a micro certification, kind of a learning tree, people are hungry to do that. And, and I kind of do that too with all my mini circ- um, certifications too. I just kind of take it as a challenge to see if I can do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's kind of, it's kind of fun, but I, every, we all like to learn, you know, and we don't stop learning in this career. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Jeff, uh, people are asking about a pediatric exam. Uh, what are they asking? When are there, is when? there a one? <clears throat> it's, um, there is an appetite for a pediatric exam. Uh, and I imagine um, you'll start hearing about it here in the future. And our friends at ELSO are coming out with their exams. So um, um, there'll be more than uh, one exam to choose from. Yeah, we can uh, bring Dr. Uh, Payton into that uh, discussion in, in just a few minutes with the panel discussion. Somebody had also asked about, I don't think the meeting has well, I don't think the CSA exam has really been around long enough to affect malpractice insurance, but that was brought up in one of the questions on whether or not passing this certification exam could help with that kind of, um, I guess they're probably talking about private practice, but. I, I remember back in the 1980s that uh, I believe it was the Woods Insurance Group actually uh, had different uh, premiums for people who were certified versus not certified, as I recall. Um, but we went through that stage in profusion uh, decades ago. But um, no, I, we haven't heard anything about that or haven't been approached, to my knowledge. You think this is going to change anything as far as uh, from state to state, as far as state licensure? Um, no, I don't think so yet. Um, uh, you know, state licensure is settled down for CCPs. There aren't too many new attempts at, uh, at starting, uh, state societies and, and writing, uh, or putting state licensure for profusion in effect. Uh, but certainly RRTs and RNs are being recognized, um, as right. ECMO specialists and practicing ECMO. Um, so... If it's going to affect anybody, it affect them. Are you seeing uh, out of that two? I think it was two hundred and forty-seven, or how many people that took your exam? How many uh, of those were non-perfusionist? Uh, in that? Uh, the majority, seventy-five uh, percent, were non-perfusionist. Right. MDs, RTs, RRTs, RNs, uh, biomed techs, and uh, then uh, there were some. There were even some people who identified themselves as perfusion assistants whose managers said they were doing ECMO monitoring. Uh, so perfusion assistants were in there too. So um, Susan, you basically have a thought on that subject for years. What is your thought on that? On the, for who takes it? You've got 70% of the people that have taken the exam that have passed it are more or less respiratory therapists and uh, other RNs and people like that. I know you were strongly for releasing ECMO or any other specialty to outside groups at one period of time. (laughs) Yeah, I still am, actually. I know we all are very busy right now because we are short of staff in almost every um, area, every hospital. Um, But it's still... I still think that it's, I don't know, I still have it dear to my heart with not to let have perfusion let go any of their services, 
So, you know, that's controversial. You know, I'm, you can talk to anybody else and they're completely against me on that. But I, I think if we just still contain our, our profession and what we do, I think, you know, I think that's the way to go. Because one of these days we might be without a job again. And I'll have to say, you know, through the years, it just wasn't physically possible to man every neonatal pediatric adult ECMO with the numbers of perfusionists that we have in our profession. So it, it had to give somewhere. And, you know, um, I mean, we can go into the or or origins back at the University of Ann Arbor or Michigan, rather, about why perfusionists were less involved in all that. But there was a general apathy out there as well with perfusionists. Um, that they didn't want their lives to be altered so much with ECMO, which we know it does 24 seven multiple ECMOs. But I think that we also realize that as a profession, at least we should be involved to some degree, if not sitting the pump then actually being that little piece of the puzzle, overseeing the equipment, overseeing certain physiological and blood gas parameters that our little niche because every specialty that's involved with ECMO has their expertise within this. It's a team approach. And without perfusionists in some of these ECMO programs, um, they may get along, but I've seen some horrifying events that occurred because perfusionists weren't involved at the right time. And that goes for any program out there. It should be a team approach. So I just don't think it was physically proper or possible to go ahead and have the labor pool to man all the ECMOs that are out there. And it still isn't at this point in time, but that's just the physical reality of it all. So, uh, but I encourage all perfusionists to be involved with ECMO as the paradigm changes, like Susan says, and CPB seems to fall off on the wayside, which hasn't happened yet, even though people have been threatening it's gonna happen every decade, I'm still waiting. So <laughs> that's my comment on it. Well, I actually want to tell, uh, basically, it's 1976, uh, Jeff, and uh, Jeff is pretty much responsible for whipping me most times in scientific approach to just about everything in perfusion. Uh, without Jeff, uh, I wouldn't even be close to where I am today or where I was in my career. He is uh, by far one of the most experienced and knowledgeable perfusionist in the field today. I really do appreciate everything you've done for me, Jeff. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, you taught me rugby. so. <laughs> and I witnessed this there when I was a fellow at Emory. So uh, we had to leave uh, emergently from a rugby game to go do an emergency, Jeff. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. Well, it's time for our class. Uh, thank you, Jeff. That was excellent. 